You're now listening to The Brian Callen Show, rated the number one podcast of all time. Of all time. Oh. Make sure you're ready, because this is the podcast where you are guaranteed to learn virtually everything. All right, everybody, this is The uh, Brian Callen Show, and I am very excited. I've got James, or Jim Rickards, who wrote a book called Currency Wars, uh, which was a Na- uh, New York Times bestseller. Uh, he's written for the Financial Times, New York Times, and Washington Post. You can follow him at, at James G. Rickards, R-I-C-K-A-R-D-S, uh, on Twitter, if you have any questions. Um, and I, let me, let me, James, let's go through, I'll just give you a quick, um, first of all, welcome to the Brian Callen Show. <laughs> really original, it's a really original show. I mean, I couldn't think of a name for my show, so I just called it My Name and then Show at the end. So. I can't, can't think of a better name. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> exactly. I can't believe a guy of your stature would call call in. Uh, usually we have, you know, comedians and just the dregs of society. Well, but, uh, you know, once he'd gotten the Washington Post and the New York Times, the Financial Times out of the way, then he could save the best for last, that's right? exactly right. <laughs> You're speaking of Hunter Motz, by the way, one of the smartest guys I know, an author and his own right. Uh, so you you basically um, were asked by the Pentagon, and you can stop me if I'm wrong here, to come up with a, a simulated war game whereby you destroyed the U.S. currency, where you destroyed the dollar, where, where, where um, essentially, instead of worrying about conventional warfare, nuclear warfare, there is something called financial warfare. And you, along with, I think, two other people came up with this sort of war game where the object was to decimate the U.S. economy and create worldwide panic. Without firing a single shot. Right. Well, well that's exactly right. This was a uh, war game hosted by the uh, the Pentagon, uh, the Office of the Secretary of Defense. It took place in 2009 at a top-secret weapons laboratory outside of Washington in the Maryland countryside. This is the first uh, two chapters of my book, Currency War. Kind of re- Currency Wars would kind of recount what happened, but you're exactly right. Um, I was asked because the Pentagon did not need any help from me in staging war games. They've been doing that for decades. <laughs> but where they uh, where they did need help was on the financial uh, side of it. They, this was the first ever financial war game, and the rules were you couldn't have any what they call kinetic weapons. Those are things that like shoot or explode or blow up. Couldn't use that. Uh, it had to be financial weapons only. So stocks, bonds, currencies, derivatives, and commodities. We had teams that you might expect. We had a Russia team, a China team, a U.S. team. But we also had a team that wasn't a country. It was banks and hedge funds. And I was really – I did play the game, which was fun, but I also got to design the game. I call it Risk for Adults. Uh, we actually got to uh, – yeah, you have to make our rules. You know, how long would it last and how many moves would there be and, and how would you score points and so forth. So we did all that. Uh, then we, we got to uh, play the game. I was on the – China team, uh, but I recruited some friends from Wall Street to play on the Russia team. Uh, we met at a restaurant before the game and cooked up a little plan. Of course, you know, as loyal Americans, our job was to cause as much harm uh, as possible within the confines of the laboratory, obviously helping to teach the Pentagon what could happen. So uh, so we'll be a little better prepared if it, if it happens. So it had a very serious side to it, but uh, it was new and it was uh, fun and it's all it's all covered in the book. And, and is there any truth to the fact that there's a currency? That there's always a low-grade currency war going on in the world, isn't there? I'm always amazed at how "quote unquote" allies are always jockeying for position. The amount of industrial espionage that China um, engages in with the United States and other countries, and for that matter, other countries and our own country with other countries. Uh, there, there, there seems to be a great deal of industrial espionage. There always seems to be some kind of a low-grade financial or economic. Uh, warfare. Am I am I correct in that? Well, well, you're right, Brian. There's always something going on. I mean, go back to the Napoleonic Wars. You know, England blockaded the coast of France, and that was economic in nature, even though there was a war going on. So it always plays a role. But um, what's new is that, uh, and we, we have actually two separate things. There's currency. There were currency wars and financial war. Let's just take them separately. A currency war is primarily economic. That's when one country cheapens its currency on purpose. In order to sell more exports, you know, let's say you're Indonesia, you want to buy a jet plane, you're looking at Boeing in the United States, and you're looking at Airbus in Europe, they're the two big manufacturers. Well, if the dollar gets cheaper, that Boeing aircraft looks a little bit cheaper, so maybe you'll buy Boeing and that'll create some jobs. 
That's the theory anyway. It doesn't actually usually work out that way. What you end up with is inflation. I mean, if you could, if cheapening your currency were the way to uh, prosperity, where did Zimbabwe go wrong? I mean, that's the, uh, <laughs> that's the point I, uh, you know, I, I try to make. But uh, but there is a, there is that prevailing view. So that's what a currency war is. Now, financial war is a little different. There, it's not primarily economic. You're actually trying to destroy the enemy the way you would with um, you know, military invasion or bombs or submarines or missiles or anything else, except you're using economic weapons. And this is something we call asymmetric warfare. There's not a military in the world that can stand up to the United States military toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Right. So, I mean, you know, we've got 12 aircraft carriers. The Chinese have one, except they don't know how to land on them, so it makes it a little <laughs> trickier. Um, but that's not and, a uh, central part yeah, of, like, having an yeah, aircraft not, carrier. Not important, not no. important. It's all for show. You just fly, you take off and fly home. But, that's exactly uh, right. But, but, but that's right. So they cannot, they cannot stand up to us. But asymmetric warfare, what is that? Well, it's chemical, biological, radiological. Um, weapons of mass destruction of various kinds, cyber warfare, and now financial warfare. Financial warfare is the new kid on the block. I mean, if the Chinese could destroy the New York Stock Exchange and wipe out the wealth of the American people, game over. I mean, you don't need to bomb us. You just need yeah. to wipe the, out our, our the, 401ks. The only problem is that their economy is so so tied to our economy. I mean, what what in the world would they do? They they, they need us to buy their products. So they, they there's a symbiotic relationship, it seems to me, between China and, and, and it isn't isn't the global economy becoming more and more connected as opposed to uh, detached? Is it is it less compartmentalized or is it more compartment is it, is it is it more compartmentalized? Oh no Brian, you're exactly right. The the degree of interconnectedness is probably greater than ever. The degree of complexity is greater than ever. They are highly dependent on us as we are on them. We're, you know, we're dependent on them to buy our treasury bonds to finance our trillion-dollar-year deficits. Uh, they're dependent on us to buy their stuff so they don't have unemployment problems that could, could cause riots. So you're right about that mutual dependency. But remember, in, in warfare, it usually isn't that destructive. I mean, but, but the point being, uh, there's always a cost involved. So if you're going to confront the United States, how do you want to spend your money? You could take it in economic damage, and I agree that a financial warfare, a financial warfare would cause economic damage, or you could spend trillions of dollars to build aircraft carriers and submarines and your missile fleet. So there's just different ways of incurring costs. Um, nobody wants a war. I'm not suggesting that, but what I'm saying is, I mean, for example, here's a scenario. What if um, an independence party won an election in Taiwan and said they're going to declare independence. Well, it's highly predictable that China would invade because they've made it clear that they will never let Taiwan break away. They, exactly. don't, consider, they, can, they don't consider it a country. They consider it a, a, what they call the runaway province. Exactly. So let's say they plan to invade. Well, the president would send in the Seventh Fleet to interdict the invasion. We could probably do that successfully, sink the Chinese in their tracks. But what if they had a financial weapon? They wouldn't hmm. actually have to use it. They just it would, The deterrent effect alone... Now you're back to sort of Cold War mutual assured destruction, but instead of nuclear weapons, we have financial weapons. Give, so give, give of, me an example. Of ways to play out. Sure. Give us an example of a financial weapon. Give us an example of how how someone could, uh, uh, in the perfect world, destroy the dollar or at least ca cause great damage to the dollar. Well, let's just say uh, they have three trillion dollars. That is, the Chinese have three trillion dollars in reserves. So let's just say they took uh, oh a hundred billion, right, which is just a small fraction of three trillion. Uh, set up 10 uh, covert hedge funds, gave them $10 billion each, uh, you know, hired enough lawyers and bankers and rented directors to make it all look perfectly legal with, you know, phony baloney names, and then they just start trading in our systems uh, and get form trusted relationships with Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, etc. They look like normal hedge funds, and then one day they wake up and they all flood the market with sell orders, you know, sell Apple, sell Google, sell IBM, sell Comcast, etc. across the board, uh, and then, you, by the way, you'd probably do that. You wouldn't do that on a day when the market was going up. You'd wait for a day when the market was down, you know, two, three hundred points already, and then pile on. That's what the military calls a force multiplier, which is, you know, rolling a rock down a hill instead of up a hill. Uh, and then just sort of keep going, keep mm. selling. To try and um, create, essentially, a panic. Yeah. Correct. And you could do it multiple <clears throat> markets at once. You could use leverage. You could use borrowed money options uh so and, the moral uh, the moral of the story is if the if the if the taiwan declares independence do not trade with new chinese hedge funds <laughs> that's exactly right that's what we that's what we tell the pentagon but there's that <clears throat> but, but you're right but there, there are many ways for it to play out by the way this is going on today in gold uh china is the world's largest producer of gold 
about 350 times a year. Uh, the next closest is somewhere in the low 200s. Uh, they are the world's largest importer of gold. They're bringing in uh, about 700 tons a year, so they're adding 1,000 tons a year. They're doing this covertly. They're using agents, uh, military and intelligence assets. The last time China updated their gold position was 2009. They said they had just over 1,000 tons, but that was four years ago. Uh, they've probably acquired two or 3,000 tons in the meantime. I expect sometime in the next year, maybe 2014, they'll announce, hey, guess what, world, we actually have you know, fill in the blank, but maybe 5,000 tons. Uh, and that's going to be a shock. I mean, why are they buying well, gold? Why is that? Why Why is hoarding gold and mining and hoarding gold uh, uh, important for an economy? Uh, two reasons. Number one, it gives you a plan B. If you want it, like nobody wants the yuan. Nobody wants the Russian ruble. Right. Uh, they're, they're just other paper currencies. There is no way they're anywhere close to replacing the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency. But if you had a gold-backed currency, uh, that would be one way to do it. The other thing is uh, we can uh, look at the possible collapse of the international monetary system in the next four or five years. That's not meant to be a provocative statement. The system has actually collapsed three times in the past hundred years, uh, 1914, 1939, 1971. If it collapses again, it's not the end of the world. We don't all live in caves with baked beans. You know, we, what happens <laughs> with, is baked, with baked beans? beans? Or, I love that that's your idea of Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Or, but then, you, if you're from baked, South Jersey, you, that is there the it is. I got my cans of baked beans. What are you going to yeah. do? We put, we put glasses and sugar in them in, uh, in South Jersey. But, you know, <laughs> but, but the point is it's not, it's not an apocalypse. What it means is that the major financial and trading powers in the world sit down and reform the system. So to me, the interesting question is who has a seat at the table? How big is your pile of chips? You know, think of it as a game of Texas Hold'em around the international monetary system. You know, China wants a bigger pile of chips. That means they'll have a bigger voice in the future. So there are very large geopolitical aspects to all this. It doesn't have to break out in a war. It just means you need to be able to throw your weight around or credibly threaten to do things, and then you'll get what you want. So, uh, by the way, for, for younger people, I mean, there, if you're just, you know, you're 25 or 30, you're just starting out in your career. You know, I strongly encourage people to save. Uh, the, the power of compound interest over a lifetime is enormous. But you're, the danger is how do you save? What do you put your money in? Is it the stock market? Do you, do you buy a house? Do you buy a little bit of gold? You know, et cetera. These are really important decisions because uh, making money is fine, but the way to get wealthy is to avoid losing money. Mm. And if you make the wrong choice and something, you know, you buy stocks, but it's a bubble and it's down 30%. You know, next year or something. That's that's a that's a lot to recover from. And so, uh, absolutely, information is is key, and it's very difficult unless you have expert guidance. I mean, my my brother in law invests my money. He's done a very good job, but but if I didn't have somebody I could rely on, I wouldn't know what to do. I mean, he's got me in a conservative portfolio, but man, is there a lot of information out there, and it's very easy to get swayed one way or another, <clears throat> depending on on the way the wind blows. Um, you, you bring up, um, you know, as you're talking, I'm thinking about, you know, you, you did this simulation in 09 and I'm, I'm looking at, uh, Europe's economy and I'm looking at the challenges, say France and Spain and Italy and my God, Greece, etc., are, are, are facing. Now, a lot of this is their own fault, perhaps, especially in Greece and things. You could, you could make the argument that there was a, there was this sort of systemic corruption where people didn't want to pay taxes and they were, and by the way, you could also probably make the argument that the euro is a failed experiment because the Greek productivity is just not the same as German productivity. Uh, so, so you can't value or devalue your currency according to your workers' productivity. It's set in Brussels. Probably a big mistake. I don't know if the euro is going to last. I want to talk to you about that. And, and then we're going to get into the gold standard. And I want you to explain that to us. But, but uh, and, I, and I also want to raise the point of too big to fail, some of the other things. But let's just talk about, as you're talking here, as you write this, you wrote this book, I'm looking at, at you know, Europe has been in the longest, I think, depression, the longest slump, and it's a serious depression in certain areas. Uh, it's longer than I think it, it was after, after the world wars. Am I correct in that? Well, they're certainly uh, suffering the uh, recession right now, and uh, other parts of the world are seeing various degrees of growth. So uh, at a very superficial level, Europe looks like they're having a difficult time, which they are. And youth unemployment in Spain, Italy, and Greece, and places like that is uh, you know, upwards of 20 25%, sometimes even higher. So that's, that's the nuts. bad news. The good, the good news is Europe is doing everything right. 
Europe is doing what it needs to do. The euro itself is strong and getting stronger. I and mean, if you actually look at the chart, uh, the euro is uh, very close to the high end of its training range. You know, it came out in 2000 at a dollar 16, and today it's around a dollar 31. So it's actually stronger. Is that right? Out. I didn't that, know that. Is that is that because Europe is restricting the number of euros they are allowing to be printed? How is why what when you say Europe's doing everything right, explain that to me. They have a very well, very sound monetary policy and a lot of people uh you know, particularly in the United States, I like to say the only people who know less about uh, the euro than Americans are the Brits because they really hate the euro. <laughs> but uh you know, a lot of Americans unfortunately get their news from the Financial Times, which is a great you know, and the economists, which are great uh, sources of, of sort of misinformation on the euro. But but the, Oh the, really? Really, really, the Financial yeah. Times and the Economist are, are... well. They're, well, they're English. They're, they hate oh, they hate Europe, right? So, uh, but the problem is, if you actually talk to Germans and Spanish and Italians and drill down, what you see first of all, the currency is you know exactly as I described. It's stronger than when it came out, stronger than it's been uh, at various times over the past couple of years. But um, that's because they have a sound monetary policy. Americans tend to conflate the bonds, the banks, and the currency, and there are three different things. The bonds are a mess. The Greek bonds have already partially defaulted. Some of the banks are going bankrupt as we speak, but that doesn't mean the currency goes down. Take uh, the dollar, for example. When Lehman Brothers failed in 2008, they defaulted on billions of dollars worth of bonds. Well, that was the end of the bonds, but it wasn't the end of the dollar. In other words, a currency has a separate life independent of the financial instruments denominated in the currency. So that's part of the reason that the euro is strong, even though the economy there is a mess. Now, what they're doing, Europe, the United States, and China, and Japan, all have to go through major structural adjustments. What's happening is that Europe is actually taking its medicine, stepping up to the plate, and doing the necessary structural adjustments. It's painful now, but they'll be much better off going forward. China and the U.S. are in denial. Uh, we have not made the structural adjustments, neither have the Chinese. We're going to hit the wall, and it's going to be much worse for us going forward. Um, and by the way, you talked about Greek productivity. Very interesting case. Uh, the Chinese came in. There was a major Greek port in Piraeus, and you know, the Greeks wanted to privatize because they needed the money. But in typical style, they sold half the port. So they sold <laughs> half the port to the Chinese. Yeah, in typical they, style. Everybody's got their head, everybody yeah. has to have their, be, their beak wet. I love it. Correct. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So they, they, half of it's Greek, half is Chinese. Well, that's like a controlled experiment. You don't often get to do controlled experiments in economics, but here was a good one because the Chinese own half and the Greeks own half. Well, guess what? The ships are lined up to unload on the Chinese side because they'd rather pay the demurrage for standing in line and get unloaded faster than to go to the Greek side. Who knows what's going to happen? <laughs> amazing. <laughs> amazing. That makes right. total sense. That's so interesting that you people just that it, marketplaces adjust information. The minute you find out that's the Greek side, that's not going to be very efficient. Nothing to and do I got to yeah. grease a bunch of palms. I'm going over the, to, 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 the, to the free market side over there, right? I mean, that's yeah, amazing. And, the, and, the, and the, the Chinese have four people on a crane. The Greeks have nine people on a crane. I mean, it's not a safety <laughs> issue. You probably need two. Amazing. But, uh, How many yeah. Greeks does it take to unload a ship? <laughs> unload, right? yeah, the answer is nine, but, but, uh, <laughs> but it only takes four Chinese. So that's the. Uh, but but, but uh, it's very serious. Now, this is a, a really good case of what's going on. Now, the other thing that's happening that's positive is unit labor costs are declining, which makes them more globally competitive. Now, the, the, now let, you, let me you, stop, let me stop sure, you because yeah, a lot of sure. people, because you're using big words here for a lot of people, unit labor costs, explain that to me. Just, just wages, in other words. Wages. That's the simplest way. Gotcha. So in, Jan in January 2012, you had people like Nouriel Rabini and Joe Stiglitz running around Davos with their hair on fire saying, you know, the euro is falling apart, Greece has to quit, and Spain has to quit. And the idea was you'd quit the euro, go back to the drachma or the peseta or the lira, and inflate your currency, and that would make your labor cheaper. Well, guess what? There's another way to make your labor cheaper, which is just cut the pay. And mm -hmm. uh, stick to the euro, stick to a sound currency, but cut the pay. Now, a 50-year-old Greek would rather throw a smoke bomb and take a pay cut. I agree with that. But a 25-year-old <laughs> Greek with a college degree who's never had a job and does not have anchored expectations about how much she should be making, you put in a BMW assembly plant financed with Chinese capital and offer the person an entry-level position with training and advancement, they'll take the job. That, that's, 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 what, that's fascinating, and that, I never thought of that, um, Jim. That, that makes a lot of sense. But that, the problem is, is that the 25-year-olds have so little political power, and, I mean, they're not getting the jobs regardless. Regardless. Like the people, and actually, a lot of the 25 year olds are the ones throwing the smoke bombs because they don't understand that it's in their interest to take that pay cut. Well, things are, look, there have been some messy scenes, no doubt about it, Hunter, but things are starting to change. I mean, Ford 
Motor Company is putting three billion dollars into a new assembly plant in Spain. Uh, Peugeot is putting a French company, right, putting three billion dollars into a new assembly plant in Spain. Wow. So they're going to Spain because, yeah, okay, youth labor unemployment is twenty five percent, but they're educated and mm-hmm. they want to work. They just can't get jobs. Well, here come the jobs. So this is a normal adjustment process. It is painful. But Europe's looking at a much brighter future. I, I would say the periphery, Southern Europe, uh, you know, two years from now is going to be like Singapore on the Med. They're going to have globally competitive, competitive wages, uh, an influx of Chinese capital, German technology. By the way, the Chinese are dying to invest in Europe because they want to get out of dollars because we're trying to inflate the dollar. That, but they don't want to be the suckers. They, don't, they didn't want to come into Europe three years ago when it looked like it was falling apart. They wanted to see the Europeans get their act together, but now they do have their act together, so the Chinese capital is coming in. It, it, it sounds as though, to me, um, and, and that's fascinating because it sounds to me like, like anything else, you've got this educated populace, you've got fairly stable uh, countries, to, for the most part, in, in, in Western Europe. By the way, it's fun to live in those countries. Uh, so it, it, it does seem like the marketplace is working. There is a there is a there is a vacuum. There is there is available and labor. People are willing to work for way cheaper than they used to because they're younger and they. It, but something is better than nothing. Uh, um, am, am I? Am, I mean, this is this sounds to me, um, Jim, like the marketplace at work and at its best. It sounds like Europe is actually a beneficiary of of a true free market here. I think that's right, Brian. And by the way, the United States says anything but. I mean, you, you look at the other two major economic blocks. I mean, of course, Japan's important, but I'm thinking of the United States and, and China. It's hard to know who's more engaged in central planning, the Communist Party of China or the, the Federal Reserve. Uh, I mean, they're both, <laughs> wow. they're both doing central planning uh, you know, 24-7. Uh, I think the Chinese are a little better at it, but uh, but our, <laughs> well, they're our, open about it, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we we are communists, so we are central planners. But uh, Bernanke doesn't want to admit that. But look, if you manipulate the price, like, interest rates are the price of money. If you manipulate interest rates, you're manipulating the price of money. Well, every other market is denominated in money. When you talk about Apple at four hundred fifty dollars a share, or gold at twelve fifty an ounce, or whatever it may be, you're always coming back to the dollar. So indirectly, they're manipulating every market in the world. You can't get good price signals, good capital allocation, or good growth when there's this much confusion. I mean, just look at this whole, you know, for two years we had risk on, risk off. Now it's, you know, taper on, taper off. Uh, who knew that tapering would be so popular? But but people go to work in the morning. They don't think about fundamentals. They don't think about growth. They think about the Fed tapering. And it, uh, uh, um, it, the Fed tapering. Explain that to our listeners. Uh, yeah, uh, t- uh, releasing money slowly, uh, controlling the 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 printing, manipulating the print. It, money is not tied to American productivity or even the world, the global marketplace. Rather, it's it's uh, sort of planned on a board by Bernanke and his and his friends. Uh, is that what you're saying? That's exactly right. The Fed has printed uh, over uh, $2 trillion uh, of new money in the last four years. Uh, actually, it's about $2.5 trillion at this point. Uh, in 2009, the Fed balance sheet was $800 billion. Today, that number is over $3 trillion, but they're printing $85 billion a month, which comes out to over $1 trillion per year. Which causes With inflation, the- doesn't it? Uh, well, it it should, and it, it will at some point, but there are two parts to inflation. One of them is the money printing, and you're absolutely right about that. But the other one is the turnover, like how quickly does the money turn over? Are people you know, borrowing and lending and spending and going out to dinner and taking their friends and buying drinks for everyone at the bar, or are they leaving the money in the bank, staying home, watching TV? Well, lately, they're staying home, watching TV. In other words, you can print all the money you want. You can leave it on street corners, but if people don't pick it up and spend it, you don't have an economy, and that's the Fed's problem right now is that they are printing the trillions of dollars I described, but the psychology is not there. So the Fed has to lie to us and manipulate our behavior through various means. They've got to make us feel good. They've got to make you know, the three of us and everyone uh, listening to your program go out and spend money, and you know, we kind of don't feel like it. We feel like you know, we, 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 do, we inha- Yeah, we don't trust it because of that the scare of 2007, but explain to me. The, you know the, the American housing market in many areas, Miami and 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 you know different uh, uh, Vegas and California for that at least has really bounced back. Wall uh, the Economist ran a front page uh, article saying Wall Street is back with this big bull. Uh, so the, 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 a lot of if you listen to and read some of the media, the the the, the future looks bright and maybe it's already here. Uh, um, why is that? Is it, it sounds to me like this is. Bernanke 
when when he makes money this available and he keeps interest rates so low, people can borrow money to buy a house, etc. And it is creating, to an extent, you're saying an artificial bubble once again. That's clear. I wouldn't say Wall Street is back. I would say the bubbles are back. Now, we talked a minute ago about all this money printing and how it has not found its way into the economy because people are not lending and spending the way they did. But it has found its way into the asset bubbles, to stocks and housing. Now, more than 50% of the wealth of the American people is in two asset classes, housing and stocks. So what the Fed is trying to do is pump up the value of those two things to create what they call the wealth effect. The wealth effect, now by the way, these are all psychological games. The idea of the wealth effect is, oh, gee, if my home equity is going up and my 401k is going up, I feel better and I might uh, be willing to spend a little more and that will get the economy going. The problem is the empirical evidence for the wealth effect is extremely thin. Uh, it has very little impact at all, though the Fed's relying on kind of some out-of-date you know, out studies in that regard. Uh, it's really not changing behavior. But, but here's the problem. It, it, this is what is called bending the velocity the curve. Velocity is the technical name for this turnover of money we talked about. The Fed has not been successful so far. I like to say it's a, it's a scary thing when the central bank wants inflation and can't get it. But uh, but the problem is, what if they do? What if they do bend the velocity curve? What if people do start spending? That could you let that genie out of the bottle? It it could take off like a rocket, and that is what happened in the 1970s. Um, you know, the Fed thinks they can dial inflation up from one percent to two percent to three percent. If it gets too hot, they can dial it down, but it might go up to four percent and next stop ten percent. You know, because all of a sudden people lose confidence in paper money. That's these are the risks that the Fed is taking. I don't think they're well understood. Well, and that's what I think. That's the thing. A lot of what you're talking about here is trust. Like, does a person trust a currency? Do they have trust that the economy is doing well and I should be spending my money? I mean, so much of it is about like what is the psychological state of the people. Right? That's right. That's exactly right. And I think yeah. the other thing that's really interesting is you – I mean, I've just finished your book, and it's it's really awesome. And there's a quote in there from uh, John Maynard Keynes, who, for the listeners, is probably the most influential economist, right? His ideas Well, certainly are, for the left. Certainly yeah. Paul Krugman and those guys are always saying, you know, uh, we need – we need, essentially the government should – Keynes essentially said the government should step in in times of crisis and, and – and, Either either uh, manipulate currency or at least spend money, invest in the economy so that the private economy can get back on its feet. I mean, I, I'm I'm being I'm giving you a very a layman's outline there, obviously, but right. I mean, but right, that's, that's that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My, my issue is I, I like Keynes. I just don't like Keynesianism. And the distinction is <laughs> John, John Maynard Keynes died in 19, I think, 1946. Uh, I think it was 1946. Uh, and he was a very pragmatic person. Now, you're absolutely right. In the 1920s and early 1930s during the Depression, he said that government spending could pick up the slack from private spending, which wasn't happening. But it was very specific to those circumstances. Later in life, uh, at Bretton Woods, he actually proposed a, a world currency backed by commodities, including gold. That's not as well known. But the problem is after he died, Keynes' Keynes ideas were hijacked by the faculty at Harvard and MIT, and they created something called Keynesianism, mm. which uh, which is it took on a life of its own. And you're yeah. right, it does mean uh, spend money. And those uh, damn when, those damn academics who never spend any time in a real it. they don't spend any time <laughs> in, a, in a real marketplace. That that's exactly right. They yeah. do. You know, you know, it's it's like if you do um, biological research, you know, you're working on the germ weapons. You know, they put you in a kind of a level three hot zone, and, and I wish they would do the same thing with economics academics. <laughs> yeah. let, let them do whatever they want, but don't let the ideas you know, leak out into the public. <laughs> that's great. That, that's spoken like a true, a man of the marketplace yeah. who's, had to, who's had to make a profit and actually live in the real world. Uh, I love people like you, and I love what you say about uh, banks being too big to fail. You were going to, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. Hunter was going to read the quote that McCain said, uh, there is no subtler, no surer means of overturning the existing basis of society than to debauch the currency. The process engages all the hidden forces of economic law on the side of destruction and does it in a manner which not one man in a million is able to diagnose. And I have to say, I am not that one man in a million. Like, yeah. you know, I mean, I think this is the thing is, is that, you know, especially now with, you know, derivatives and all of that sort of stuff, it's become very hard to know what is real, like what has actual value and what is that value. And I mean, for, for for me, one of the things that I really enjoyed about your book is you referenced Joseph Tainter, who wrote this book called The Collapse of Complex Societies. Um, and in there, Tainter has a diagram where he basically shows what happened to the silver coinage over time. And in 68 AD, the coins were 91.8% silver. By 211 AD, they'd gone to 583 
Mm-hmm. Right. So right. Es- essentially what's happening is, is that as they struggle to pay their debts, right, because they're constantly having to hire more and more and more mercenaries, what they do is they dilute out the currency until the currency is no longer valuable. People lose faith in the currency. And then what happens is, is that nobody will accept it. And then trade networks collapse. And that's basically why the Roman Empire collapsed. Well, th- that's exactly right. And, uh, you know, of course, that was started that you referred to. That was Emperor Nero. He started the debasement. And of course, he was... Uh, Hebrew uh, numerology. Uh, his name came out to six six six. Yeah, he was a real piece. sweetheart, Nero. In, in, Great in the fiddle book, player. In the book of uh, book of Revelation. But uh, but seriously, that that's exactly now now people are well acquainted, fairly well acquainted with the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, and Tainer talks about that. But I thought what was fascinating about Tainer's book, he looked at thirty or more civilizations, some of them quite large, you know. Manila and their Mycenaean or Roman, but others, you know, smaller civilizations that might have existed for a few hundred years in the southwest uh, desert, present-day New Mexico, and so forth. And he tried to understand what was the common thread in the collapse of civilization. Now, most uh, scientists, anthropologists, and historians say, well, you know, it was a drought over here. This civilization collapsed because of an earthquake. This civilization collapsed because the barbarians invaded, you know, et cetera. And what Tainer found out is that when, when they fell to barbarians, the barbarians had invaded before but been resisted, or when they fell to earthquake, earthquakes had happened before but been rebuilt, et cetera. So what he said, it's not the barbarian or the earthquake or the drought, it's the action-response function. It's, there comes a time when the people of civilization say, you know what, we're not rebuilding this time, or we're not fighting the barbarians. We give up. But what is it that makes people give up? A lot of it was tax policy. In the Roman case, for example, um, they were taxing the farmers, raising taxes. The farmers resisted by stopping, uh, they, they stopped growing crops. And then the Roman Senate said, well, we're going to tax you on the crops you could have grown, but for the <laughs> fact that you didn't choose to grow them. So you might as well grow them because we're going to tax you anyway. Well, when the barbarians came in, and this is, this is good history, the barbarian tax policy was 10%. They said, give us 10% and we'll protect you. That's, that's about mm. as... Uh, Sounds like as a deal com- to me. Yeah. That's about <laughs> as complicated oh, the- as, as barbarian government got. You know, yeah. 10% yeah. tribute and we'll protect you. It's protection well, money. It's, it's, it, it just comes down to numbers, man. Correct, the but, Godfather. The, but, the, but the Roman farmers say, well, Rome, Rome wants 20%, and they give us no protection. You barbarians want 10%, and you'll watch out for us, so come on in. It was, they didn't fight the barbarians all the way to Rome. They let them in. They collapsed because – but, by the way, this, to me, closely resembles Washington today. You know, unemployment in Illinois is 9%, but you go to Washington, D.C., metro area, it's like 5%. That's because they're sucking the country dry and spending it on themselves. So they look like the new Rome or the new Babylon. There's a, pick, listen, but, Rich, Rich uh, Jim, you're so right. I mean, the bottom line is if you look at the nine counties around Washington, D.C., Potomac and Bethesda, they are some of the wealthiest counties in I was just down there some of the wealthiest counties in the country guess what they don't produce a thing besides lawyers and lobbyists okay and 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 one I went to college down there 20 years later I'm I'm up there doing stand up that town hasn't moved baby they have there are no new restaurants there's no innovation in that place that that is a stagnant pond Get, getting into washington takes you 2 hours from potomac which is a 13 mile drive at the most or even less you you're stuck in traffic it's just this pipeline of sycophants and everybody is eating from the government trough it's just it's just not the way to go man it's not- right and we're, we and your listeners are the ones who are filling that trough all the bureaucrats are second to try but this is you know look it's a common political complaint but it has happened before many times uh you know we, we have bureaucrats ancient civilizations had priests yes. or you know temple yes. uh, yeah people maintaining the temple but it's the same deal it's an elite that sucks everybody else dry. That's but, what's going on. But you're such a practical guy, and I love I love that that you were able to do this podcast because here's here's the big question: <clears throat> What do we do about it? And your 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 book addresses this, but but help us help us through the the uh, the far uh, lead us to, uh, from the forest here. The, the, what what do we do? I mean, give me give me give me some practical solutions. You advocate. You talk about the gold standard. You talk about anchoring the dollar to the gold standard, although I think that you, people have a simplistic notion of what the gold standard is. Uh, so so, so give, us, give us what – if I, I make you the emperor of the United <laughs> States or the world, what, what, is it, what are the things you do? Well, the first thing I would do is eliminate the corporate income tax because it's the most inefficient tax you can think of. Corporations just pass it on, so let's cut out the middleman. You know, they pa- they pass it on to the consumer. Right, either consumers or shareholders or employees or somebody, but they pass it on. So it's inefficient. Get rid of it. Get rid of capital gains tax. Right? How do you get a capital gain? Well, you got to work and make money, pay tax on it, 
take what's left over, invest in something, it goes up, and you sell it, they tax you again. So that's a double tax. Get rid of that. I, I'll tell you, if you get rid of corporate income tax and capital gains tax, the stock market, I, I would sell gold and buy stocks at that point. You, you change policy, I'll change my view. So that, that's one thing. Second thing is break up these big banks. You know, 2008, everyone talked about too big to fail. Well, guess what? Five years later, those banks are bigger. The five largest banks in the United States are bigger than they were in 2008. They have a larger percentage of the total banking assets. They have bigger derivatives books. They're more interconnected. Every problem we had in 2008 is worse today. Now it's wow. been papered over by the Fed, but they've solved no problem. So I would expect another collapse in the next you know, three to five years, somewhere in that time frame. It's not a 10-year forecast. I think it'll be much sooner than that because all the conditions are there. I mean, I don't need, uh, I don't need to, to see an avalanche to know that the, the, the snow is unstable well, and it's going to fall. Well, let, I, let, me, let, me, let me just stop you there because, the, 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 uh, you know, when you say eliminate the corporate, corporate tax, income tax, and capital gain tax, there are a lot of people on the left that would say, you know, that's exactly what the problem is. Corporations are getting too big and strong when you eliminate their taxes. What we pay taxes, why shouldn't corporations pay taxes? Explain to us, explain, uh, rebut that argument. Because you hear the popular argument, at least in the mainstream media, is corporate taxes are too low. They cheat on their taxes. They don't pay taxes. They pay 15% taxes. I mean, uh, Mitt Romney in his election, he, he most of his money came from capital gains. He only paid 15%. That's outrageous. He's the elite. Explain to us why that thinking is wrong. Because you, you kind of, you know, I understand. I know the argument, but but give it to us for a second. Yeah, look, I'm perfectly fine with individuals paying taxes on the money they make or the gains. But here's what you could do. You could take a corporation. Well, corporations have stockholders, you know, maybe perhaps millions of stockholders. Every, what you could do, every year the corporation could compute its gain or loss and then send a, a, a notice to every stockholder based on a certain day saying, here's your share. Now, put it on your personal tax return and pay personal tax on it. I'm not saying it should be, it should escape taxation, but tax at the individual level. What we do, we tax at the corporate level. Then I pay you a dividend, and then we tax it again at the individual level. It's a level. double tax, double tax. It's a double tax. Well, how do you expect to grow businesses and grow jobs? And by the way, capital gains, uh, forget about I mean, You can talk about IBM and uh, Google or General Electric. That's fine. But what about the entrepreneur? What about the startup? What about you know three or four you know, garage band entrepreneurs who are the future Googles and uh, you know, Amazons of the world? How are those people... Uh, you know the the twenty somethings and the people in their early thirties. How are they supposed to get off the ground if you're taxing them every step of the way? So, well, uh, by not, the way, that, that's where jobs come from, not from big business, but from exactly, business. exactly. And exactly. it's not just it's not just the financial costs; it's also the time and complexity costs. The point is is that you know people who are in their twenties and thirties, like if you start having taxes upon taxes and they have to file all of that paperwork. That becomes a real barrier to entry. Like the, right. the more complicated your corporate structures are, the, the fewer you, people. You would would you up. simplify the tax code? Would you have a flat tax? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I go back to the barbarian policy. I have a zero bracket up to some amount. You don't pay anything. Then who knows? Maybe a ten percent bracket and maybe a twenty percent bracket. People actually don't mind paying twenty percent. By the way, when there's there are a lot of studies over time that show you know at times in the past the United States statutory rates have been 50%, sometimes 70%, sometimes 90%. But what the studies show is that the effective rate, the amount that people actually pay, is pretty constant around uh, somewhere between 25 and 30%. In other words, when you make the statutory rate higher, you don't get more revenue. You get more avoidance, evasion, loopholes, et cetera. Yeah, lawyer, you know, I, lawyer I, tax lawyers just make more money. <laughs> that's right. By the way, I, I, uh, you know, among other things, you know, I, I manage an investment banker and author and so forth, but I'm also I was – um, International Tax Council, the Citibank, for ten years. I'm a I'm a lawyer by training, and I started my career in taxation. Did you know? And did you know a man named Mike Callan? <clears throat> I knew Mike from Saudi Arabia. Yeah, Mike. I, I Mike. Was... Mike is my father. <laughs> is he? <laughs> yes. Well, what a great guy. I I knew Mike back in when he was in Riyadh at Saudi he, American he, Bank. And yep. Yep. Yeah. I used to I used to cover the Middle East, and uh, was out there training future generations of uh, of Arabian bankers. But my my point being, <laughs> there was a time when our chairman Walt Riston. Uh, yelled at us because we weren't paying enough taxes. We were so good at it. We we, we <laughs> zero it out. And he said, come on, guys, we're the biggest bank in the world. We can't pay zero. Yep. Could you pay a little something? And it was harder to pay something than pay nothing because we had to, like, you know, figure out which deductions we didn't want to take. So my, my point being, the corporate tax is a very expensive, very inefficient joke. And just get rid of it. But, you know, pass the amounts to the individuals and let them put it on their personal tax returns. One That's of the fantastic. things that I thought you were talking about that was interesting is in terms of that avalanche, because you give that analogy in your book, right, in terms of, right. yeah, and would you mind, like, explaining that as well? 
Sure, because I, I'll say, you know, the international monetary system will collapse sometime in the next three to five years, which it will. And people say, well, Jim, what's going to be the triggering event? And I say, it doesn't matter because what matters is the instability of the system. So a snowflake falls on a snowpack. You know, I always think of the Y ball out of the Aspen Highlands, but a lot of other examples. So a snowflake falls. It disturbs a few flakes around it. They spread. They, they cause some more snowflakes to come loose. Now you've got a slide. All of a sudden you've got a big chute, and all of a sudden the whole thing comes loose, and the avalanche comes and buries the village. Now when that happens, do you blame the snowflake? Or do you blame the instability of the system? My point is you have to worry about the instability of the system because if it wasn't one snowflake, it could be the one before or the one after. It's not the event. It's the instability. So I look at the banking system, the derivatives books, the interconnectedness, and I see a collapse about to happen. If it's the failure of a particular firm or you know some geopolitical event or an earthquake or tsunami, I mean, those are a big deal, but it doesn't matter. What matters is we have an unstable system that's bound to collapse. And in terms of what Brian was talking about at the beginning of the podcast, in terms of just how interconnected we are now, like that's part of the problem, right? That's absolutely part of the problem. And uh, you know, one of the big questions about finance, and, and most of the models Wall Street is using are, are, and economists use, are completely detached from reality. They have the models. They have a very compl- complicated map. I understand that. But they don't bear any relationship to reality. That's the unfortunate part. So I've been searching for, you know, 15 years, done a lot of work in physics and applied mathematics, been out to Los Alamos National Laboratory and elsewhere, thinking about what does work. And the best fit I've come up with is complexity theory. And you have to ask yourself, are capital markets complex systems uh, based on interaction and the number of participants and the diversity of views, et cetera? Well, I don't think there's any question that they are. But if you, if you reach the conclusion that capital markets are complex systems, you can now import 60 years of complexity science from other areas, such as meteorology, earthquakes, forest fires, solar flares, et cetera, bring that over to finance and get a much better understanding of how things actually work. That's what I've been doing, and that's what's wow. described in wow. chapter 10 of my book. And yeah. that's, uh, yeah. and, but, but the problem is when you do that, you realize how there's so much more risk in the system than people realize. That's the problem. And so, so, so to go back, and you, you have such a great way of explaining things. Get rid of the corporate t- tax. Get rid of the capital gains tax. And banks are simplify the tax code. Ultimately, c- come up with a flat tax. And and finally, banks are simply at a point now, which is incredible to me. Despite all the legislation, they're they're still they're bigger than they ever have been. We 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 have we still have a, a, a banking system, a financial system that is that is so clearly ready for an avalanche because the systemically we haven't done anything to change uh, uh, future avalanche uh, future future avalanches that that's right brian and and by the way uh, you know i like to say that uh, you know your dad and i worked in at citibank back in the day when it was a bank uh, yeah. with glass stigler they let all the banks they repealed glass stigler in 1999 and let the banks turn into hedge funds explain explain year. that to my listeners i always talk about one of the worst things we did was repeal glass stigler i think michael lewis in his book boomerang talks about how it happened uh, i think it was a guy named mark raquel or he was a sort of this libertarian guy out of uh, th- some think tank and i i i like a lot of libertarian philosophy but but he he was very he was really basically was one of the guys you know usually takes one energetic ideologue to kind of like garner forces around him and and he somehow was able to get glass steagall repealed he was one of the first sort of he was the catalyst i think doesn't matter who it was or how but explain to us please for a second for our, our listeners what glass steagall was and why it was repealed and why it needs to be uh, put back into place Absolutely. So for this, you have to go back to the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties. Now, during that period, what banks did is they originated really crappy loans. They put them in securities, and they sold them to their customers. And then when the crash came in 1929, the customers got wiped out. So the Congress had hearings in 1932 and 1933, and they came to the conclusion that this was a conflict of interest. They said, okay, from now on, here's the deal. You can take deposits and make loans, and you're a bank. Or you can originate and trade securities, and you're an investment bank. But you can't do both. You can't trade securities and be a commercial bank. That was the law for 65 years, all the way till 1999. Makes perfect so we, sense. Makes perfect we, we, sense to me. Right. We had some bank failures along the way, and we had an SNL crisis. But by and large, that system worked extremely well. Now, in 1999, I guess the Congress uh, thought that the Congress of 1933 were a bunch of dopes, and they said, <laughs> "Oh, oh no, it's the, it's the modern age. You know, we're so much smarter." 
So they repealed this law. They repealed Glass-Steagall and told banks they could be in the securities business. Well, guess what they did? They went out and originated a bunch of crap loans, put them in securities, sold them to the customers, and they collapsed. And you, mean, was, you, mean, you mean history repeated itself? It was an <laughs> never, exact, never heard exact, of that. Exact replay of what happened in the 20s as if, you know, so the real dose were the Congress in 1999. By the way, it was a bipartisan crime because it was promoted by Phil Graham, who's a Republican, and it was signed by Bill Clinton, who's a Democrat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm sure there were. But here's the, here's the thing about your ideologue, I, the, the fellow's name who's sort of promoting this as a free market. I'm a free market guy, right? right? But if you want free markets, have free markets. You cannot guarantee deposits, guarantee the liabilities, and say do whatever you want with the assets. Was, if, you want to, if you want to say do what you want with the assets, take away the deposit insurance. That's a free market. But once you, once you guarantee half the balance sheet, but deregulate the other half of the balance sheet, that's a recipe for collapse because you're saying, I got government guaranteed money. Well, but it's, I can it's, do whatever socializing, I it. it's socializing risk and privatizing gain, right? I mean, that's right. And you, so, you know, so these free market guys, they don't understand. Uh, well, you know, they, banks are not, nature. yeah, bankers are not living in a free market. Bankers are not capitalists. Our Correct. banking system is a socialist system, and yet they sit there and, and talk about how free markets and capitalists, you're not, you're, they're not capitalists. I, I haven't but, seen that. I, if anything, they have right. a government guarantee. Look at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Look at the way they behaved with those government. Th- these are, these are government sponsored organizations, uh, right. not unlike our agriculture industry, by the way. Right. And 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 so so when you blame the free market or you blame capitalism, man, you're, you're the people aren't looking at what the real who the real enemy is here. Well, I think Look, part- J- J- Jamie Dimon is the biggest welfare queen in America. I mean, the guy's got uh, <laughs> he's zero, he's got zero cost of funds. Tell tell, tell us who Jamie tell tell them who Jamie Dimon Morgan Jamie, Stanley's that uh, Morgan sure, Stanley's uh, yeah. J P Morgan J- uh, Jamie Dimon Jamie Dimon is the CEO of the largest bank in America, J P Morgan. Okay, so how does he run his bank? Well, he's got zero cost of funds, courtesy of the Fed. He's got underpriced deposit insurance, courtesy of the FDIC. So he's got massive subsidies that are costing savers $400 billion a year, by the way. That's the amount of wealth that's being transferred from savers to So banks. you're saying the taxpayers are subsidizing not only his salary, but banks, the biggest bank in America. Correct. And so I'm um, so saying, if you give me... If you give me zero cost of funds, guaranteed deposits, and unlimited leverage, I think I could make $10 billion too. In other words, it's not that hard. It's not that smart. <laughs> yeah, it's not rocket uh, science. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, but what he is is heavily subsidized by the federal government. So when Jamie Dimon is ready to give up his federal food stamps, you know, then uh, he can talk to me about free markets. <laughs> well, <laughs> I love it. Well, and I think part of the interesting thing, too, is, is that, you know, there's essentially we understand, like, socialism, right, communism. We know that's bad. Right. And we understand that capitalism is good and we don't understand that what's going on is not really capitalism. It's crony Correct. capitalism. Crony Correct. Capitalism, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so it's I think that's really I think, you know, in terms of words that we really need to get into the public discourse, crony capitalism is something that we really need to get out there so that we understand that what we're seeing is not extreme capitalism or really free capitalism. It's an economy of influence. It's, exactly. That's what it is. Right. It's an economy of influence. If you've got a pipeline to Washington, you spend enough money on Washington, you can figure out a way to, for, to, to get a government guarantee and government and subsidies and get and get taxpayer money to right. play with other people's money by the way right and that is exactly the disease that Tainer Joseph Tainer diagnosed in his book about the co- collapse of complex societies when the elites stop producing wealth and just extract wealth when they go from being producers to being parasites that's the beginning of the end well let, let, me, let me remind listeners that the book that Jim Rickards has written is called currency wars highly recommended and one of the things people always ask me about this podcast what books do you recommend and we're going to put it on the website um, let, let me let get, get to get bring me into the gold standard talk to me about the gold standard uh, is that something we need to bring back well, we may. Uh, I talk a lot about gold, and I recommend gold to investors, and, and I own it myself, although not more than 20% of your investable assets, so don't go all in by any means. But it's actually not my first choice. My first choice would be a strong dollar, a sound dollar policy, as we had during the 80s and 90s. The problem is the U.S. government disagrees. My opinion doesn't matter. The, the Fed and the Treasury and the White House want a weak dollar. So my view is, well, if you're going to have a weak dollar, you better have some gold in your portfolio to protect you against the catastrophic outcome of that. Now, the problem is when you go to the gold bugs and they're, they're banging the table saying, you know, we want a gold standard. And you say, what do you mean by that? A lot of times they don't know because they haven't really thought it through. But you have to ask yourself a number of questions. 
you have to say, okay, every gold standard is some relationship between paper money and gold. That's easy. What do we mean by money? There are technical uh, definitions. There's M0, M1, M2. They're all different. You have to pick one because uh, they're different amounts. The second thing you have to ask yourself is, how much gold backing am I going to have in this gold standard? You know, 100%, 40%, 20%. Historically, the U.S. had 40%, so that seems to work fine. The third thing you have to ask yourself is who's in the club. Is it just the United States or is it worldwide? Pretty much has to be worldwide because uh, if it was just the United States and we had a gold-backed currency and no one else did, we'd have the only currency anyone wanted, which would make the rest of them worthless, which would be highly deflationary. So take those three factors. So uh, we're going to use, let's say, M1. That's a one, one measure of money. We're going to have 40% backing, and it's going to be global M1, which is the combined money supplies of all the major powers. Uh, take that amount of the amount of gold they have divided by the amount of paper money. And what price do you get? And this is eighth grade math. The answer is seven thousand dollars an ounce. So uh, I don't think it's going to happen tomorrow. But when the monetary system collapses, the central banks don't want to go to a gold standard, but they may be forced to go to a gold. And they may have to, to do that. They may have to do that mathematical equation to come up with the value of the new dollar or the new currency. Correct. And all this is all this. You know, the gold supply, the money. It's all out there. It's it's publicly disclosed. The math is trivial. Uh, that's the non-deflationary price of gold if you went back to a gold standard. So my price target is seven thousand dollars an ounce. Not tomorrow. Probably not next year, but you know, sooner than later. Wow, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I, I love the way you think. It really is exciting. What were we going to say, Hunter? Uh, just to second that, it's yeah, awesome. That's, that's right, <laughs> uh, Jim Rickards. Uh, we we very much appreciate you uh, being on this uh, podcast, man. It's it's exciting. We we <laughs> it's it's always fun to talk to somebody who sits around and thinks and actually does does some good in the world. Um, and and my my job here is to, in my very small way, to create some not only inspiration but to try to disseminate the the important information. And it seems to me that your book, uh, Currency Wars, does just that. So, um, And if you guys want to follow Jim, uh, uh, Jim Rickards, you can follow him at, at James, G-R-I-C-K-A-R-D-S, uh, James G. Rickards. And I take it on your Twitter, are you always posting things, or how, how does that work? Oh, uh, I'm I'm pretty addicted, my wife would say. So yeah, there's a lot there's a lot out there. It's it's about ninety percent international monetary system and ten percent baseball. So <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Just for That's full what disclosure, you, you, what team? What team? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm a Phillies fan. Oh, I, there you I live go. in the my kids are Mets fans. I live in New York, but I, I go back to my Philadelphia roots. Oh, is that right? Okay, I love Philly. I'll be in Philly and I'll be in uh, New York. And when I am, I'm going to let you know. You got to come out to my stand up. You'll learn nothing, but I will make you laugh. I promise. Please let me know. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Hunter. Jim, you're the best. Thanks so much, man. Thanks okay. so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. That was great, man. That was awesome. Yeah, and I gotta I gotta Thank give you. public props to. Uh, to my boy uh, Hunter Motz here, who uh, um, is the one booking all these great thinkers and smart people, and I love that guy. That yeah, guy he's was awesome. Great. Yeah, that's a, that's that's the kind of guy that makes the world a better place. Yeah, absolutely. Because right. I mean, I think that's the thing is, is that he really he doesn't he's not an ideologue. He really sorts through the data, and like he said, like if new information comes along, if the policies change, he'll adapt. Yeah, like he's not going to hold firmly to a position just yeah. because it's the one that he no, held before. No, I, I love people like that. Yeah. He lives in a real world. Uh, all right, everybody, that's the Brian Count Show, and uh, just so you know, I'm not even sure when we're going to post this bad boy, but I will be at the Schomburg Improv. Uh, in uh, Illinois, uh, it's a Chicago Improv, and I will be there um, July 25th, 26th, 27th, and 28th. I hope I see you out there. And Hunter Motz, thank you for making this podcast about 100% better. You've been listening to The Brian Callen Show. Be sure to visit briancallen.com for information about this episode as well as past and future episodes. You can follow Brian on Twitter at Brian Callen and like him on Facebook. Go to facebook.com slash briancallencomedy. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time.